It's been eight years of violence, 2011 to 2019. Why some are still sleeping, some have gone to have their bath. This is how we began our journey to Uhogwa, Benin City. This is International Christian Center, Uhogwa, a home originally meant for the less privileged of this community and beyond. But since the year 2012 has opened its arms to the internally displaced persons as a result of the insurgency of Boko Haram. Today, it has over 3,000 internally displaced persons, and we have come to know exactly what life and how life is for these people. In 2015, federal troops were sent to evacuate these IDPs to the north, but that was salvaged through the intervention of the then state governor, Adams Oshomole, and some state officials, as well as well-meaning Nigerians. Today, they are stable here, but not without challenges, of course. It's not something that one ever think will happen in this country. Every time I talk about it, it really hurts me. Um, when that began to happen and I started to relate with persons who were from those areas and they were telling me their horrible stories, there were times I could not eat for two weeks. It was it's like, uh, it was just on me to do something, do something, do something, do something. And I had nothing that, I, I didn't see myself like I was capable of doing something because the the, 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 the people that had need were quite huge. There were, there were so many. And the risk in venturing into such was not like just helping orphans and other persons we had taken care of before. But uh, the pressure on me was really very, very, very high. Down deep in my heart, I felt God wanted me to do something. And not doing it made me restless. You know, I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep. Sometimes I just jump up at night and I would just be like, I'm there, I'm seeing them. And I would cry and cry and weep and weep and pray to God to stop these things. God, stop it. God, stop it. Internally displaced people are vulnerable in different ways. Lami is 18 from Chibok. She hopes to be a doctor someday and in senior secondary one. She's just about to go to her morning lessons. Her sister is one of the kidnapped Chibok girls. Her whereabouts up until today, yet unknown. Lami recalls the ordeal. The time that Boko Haram come to Chibok is just in the midnight. When we are sleeping, we, end, we are sleeping in Palomi and my younger sisters. And my mom also is sleeping. My father now lie down in veranda. In the midnight by 12, we now start hearing the shoot of gun. My mom now wake my father for him to run out of the house. My dad now run away. He now went to climb a tree. When we wake up, we now, my mom now said that we should, leave the, we should leave the house, we should run through the bush. And before we said we want to come out, the Boko Haram, they have already surrounded the place. And somebody now told my father, that, my mom, that we should not go out, that we should stay inside. When we enter inside, we are staying, we now see fire. And my mom, and I now tell my mom that we should come out of the house so that the fire will not burn us inside. In the morning, we woke up. They now say that if you know that you have a child or sister or cousin in that school, that you should go to the school. My dad now go there. Before you went there. Which school is this? 
the G, uh, GSS for girls. It's only girls that are staying there. In and where, where? In Chibok. And my dad now went there. They did not see them. And they asked of them. Some people now tell them that it's one trailer that come in and they pack all the girls and go with them. And they now ask, which roads do they follow? But some of them couldn't say that. They are all crying. And my dad now come house. He now said that they did not see our sisters from that time till today. And that my sister, before she went to the school, she came the other day. We cooked together, we eat together. She played head for us. She now played head for my mother. And my father now went and do shopping for her, buy things for her, and tell her to go back to the school. When she go back to the school, in the next day, they now capture them. When they went to the school, they did not see them, they did not see the, their things. They burnt the school and packed them all and go with them. And since she left that school, we have never heard about her, whether she's alive or she's dead, or any story about her, we have never heard. When we are in that bush, we cannot even go home to carry something to come and cook it. We are staying there for us to pick some leaf and eat, or for us to look for other fruits to eat in that bush. And at that time, we, ha we passed through so many things, especially me again. At that time, if I'm in my period, I would just look for a rug or, or shed like this to use it because I cannot see part, I cannot see anything. Some other, some other period that I passed through, even pants, I don't have it at the, in that bush. Once again, available data from Nigeria Security Trackers, NST, and the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project, ACLED, says from June 2011 through June 2018, the NST documented 2,021 incidents involving Boko Haram in which 37,530 people were killed, doubling the conventionally cited estimate of 20,000. Over the same period, ACLED identified 3,346 incidents in which 34,261 people were killed. Both totals reflect deaths of alleged Boko Haram fighters, government forces and civilians combined. Rachel and Sarah, both widows, haven't lost their husbands to the cold hands of Boko Haram terrorists. They have eight and six children, respectively. The first time that the Boko Haram is enter our town, they will just come like thief. They will shoot inside the town. Everybody will be running away. They will pack everything away. So we think that it is thief. Sometimes they will just use stick and kill people. Sometimes they will just use knife and be cutting people. So at the last time, as the time that they come, they just come and surround the town and begin to shoot everybody. As they were shooting there, that day they kill uh, civil, uh, they kill uh, uh, soldiers and uh, and some uh, all uh, the, those that are staying there in the border. They kill them. So later on. My husband just, uh, he just come from market as he was going. They meet with the people and drought. Now they use stick and kill him. As we are there preparing how to come out again, one day they just come and surround us. After they surround us, they begin to throw bomb and rocket launcher and many things. We just did it like me, I just did in the midst. But what they never touched me for that time, they was focused on soldiers. After soldiers was running away, we that women that remaining inside the house, we begin to throw children outside through the wall. So we run, we run before they follow soldier and come back, we too we have run. But they meet some women and some children that day, they pack all of them into bush. So later, as we are preparing that we want to go again, they went to my bread bakery and meet by Chad there and slaughter him. From there again, as I, we don't carry the dead body come out. After that one, I am prepared because it is only me that remain now with the, with the remaining children. The day that we want to come out, and the, I don't, that is, I don't know where my children is. After one week, me too, I run, I run along. Because you cannot be able to remember children again. When they enter like this, everybody will be scattered. Whether you get small picking or you get grown up, everybody will go on his own. 
So I don't know where my children was. Me too, I just go uh, in another way. From there, after I, I, we were running like this, some, at least some, they have reached even three years. I didn't know where they are. Boko Haram came to meet us in our village and pursued us into the mountains. We climbed into mountains for safety. Then the Wen banker wrote us a letter saying they will catch up with us. So we packed our stuff and cattle and back to the mountains. They came there, killed a lot of people, and carried them and some of their things away to Goza. After that, on Sunday, they came back again, killing many, driving others down the mountains. After that, they killed my husband. For three days, I didn't see him. I was looking for him. Then a small child told me there is a cop somewhere around, and I agreed to follow her to check. And indeed, it was my husband's corpse. They already killed him. I begged my mom and my husband's younger brother. Together, we all went and buried him. They killed him. They took away our animals, our cattle, and burnt our homes. We have nothing. That's what Bukaram did to us. So I left from Yola to Jos. Pastor Edom and I have suffered a lot and he sent money to me to come by him. Hawa is one of the elderly here. She is here with her daughter and grandchildren. This camp plays host to over 3,000 IDPs, mainly from Borno, Yobe, and Adamawa. One of the challenges here is the space to sleep in. It is 6 a.m. and we have just arrived to the camp from our hotel room on our second day. We have come to see how a day unfolds in the life of these IDPs. Hello, good morning, Pastor Evelyn. Good morning, Amaka. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Yeah, I'm fine. Just to say that we have arrived at the camp. We are in the car. Okay, okay. Okay, I'll meet you up there. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. God Amen. bless you. Amen. Thank you. All quiet and peaceful here. Pastor, you're here. Hi. You're welcome. Thank you very good much. Good morning. Did you sleep well? Yes. How was your night? It was good. We slept well too. Thank you so very much. Thank you. It's all quiet and peaceful here. Yes. So this is how life unfolds. Yes. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yes. So we'd like to see where they sleep. Can you show us that? Yes, I can. Okay. okay. We're just about to get into one of the rooms for the boys. Um, according to what Pastor Evelyn had just told me, this room, one room houses up to 7,200 of them in one room. But because of the heat, the weather is hot, that's why you can see some of them sleeping outside. But again, it is safe and secure for them. Yes, come in. Okay. For school, yeah, they've gone to hide their back. Yes, that's why they are not here now. So, at what point do they sleep? Do they have a sleeping time? Yes, so from 10 uh, p.m. That's when they sleep. Yes. Some are outside because of the heat. 
if all are here, you see everybody, just the way they are lying down, that's how everybody lies down. It's just how they lie down together. You can see this. Can you see the way the dice are? They all lie down together, just like that, because of uh, the congestion. Crowded and congested, they still sleep on, grateful they can sleep in peace as we take our steps across the room, careful not to step on them. John Ayuba is a survivor from Boko Haram attacks. He shares his story. Like for me, two of my younger ones were burnt alive in the house. In the process of that, they attacked the place up to 15 times. So I have to leave the place and go to other places. I went directly to Goza local government inside the town so that I continue schooling there. I started from JSS1. Not long there also, they, have, they attacked the place, especially my school self. They bombed the place and you have to jump the fence for your life. If not, they kill you. And they came in the afternoon in, during break time. So as we were just there, the teacher that was standing at the gate, they just started with him, they killed him. So the student have to either run through the window or jump the fence. So we have to jump the fence and run away for our safety. Some do not even have a clear memory of the horror, but carry scars that would remain a permanent reminder. When the surgeons attacked his village, the father was not at home, the mother was already dead. He had two elderly brothers who were locked up in the room by the surgeons. And then they decided to go away with him. As we were going away with him, so he was crying, he was shouting. His friend called Bale, who was 16 years then, heard his friend, John Daniel, screaming. So he decided to say, what's happening? Then he threw a silver plate into another direction to take the attention of the surgeon so that they would be able to drop him, his friend. So after doing that, they actually started shooting toward the direction of where the silver plate landed. So Bale climbed the fence, jumped down, took his friend John Daniel, and threw him across the fence to save him. And then when Bale was trying to climb the fence, they pierced him on his back of his leg. But he was able to take him and run with him for days. And because they didn't treat him on time, that is why at the time he was treated, the hands did not heal well. So if you look at the two, they are not the same. Though displaced, their hopes of education have somewhat been restored. Okay, okay, this was 11. I've been teaching in this school almost 10 years now. And in fact, the children, they are behaving well and they are performing well academically. You see, this school is not yours to teach just maybe subjects alone. The, the school is also meant to build their morals, to build them in God's way. So it's not just to teach to become a doctor, lawyer, you know, they also teach them by biblical ways how a Christian should behave, the things you need to do. Classes again are cluttered and congested. <laughs> Feeding these IDPs does not come cheap. Food, water, clothing, and electricity. All of these remain a huge challenge. The population has made us to have a lot of, uh, uh, lot of needs, like in the area of feeding. Presently, we cook more than 10 bags. In fact, conveniently for everyone in this center to eat and be satisfied, we cook 15 bags of rice per meal. That is outside the tomatoes, other things for the stew. We make between eight to nine bags of gari for a bar per, per meal. In fact, we, cook, we spend a lot cooking. We have to cook beans, three bags of beans, and so many tubers of yam, three bags of 100 kg, and so many tubers of yam to cook for children per meal. We need a lot of food stuff, like brown beans for their health, we need rice, we need 
We need things for soup and stew. We need tomatoes, both the fresh tomatoes and the tin tomatoes. We need crayfish. We need everything, even yams, gari, all kind of food items. Corn for two. We need a lot of them in this place. This food you are seeing is for 50 children. If you look at it, you can't find meat. You can't find fish inside. The children, they, they deserve balanced diet. The men, on the other hand, have their own story to tell. The first time as they are coming, they just come and kill one of our members in our church. So he's a medicine seller. They just come and shooting him inside his chemist. So from there, they are just trying to come find where we Christians are there. So one of my friends was even quickly come and tell me that these people that have already mentioned your name that they have come and find where you are. So I just quickly ran with my family. As we are running, we just enter the water. That is water in Lake Chad. That water is very deep, rich like this. I just raised some of my children on my neck. My wife has raised some. This is how we are trying to escape. We go hiding around the place where surrounded by water. It's there we slept daybreak. So by 8 o'clock in the morning, we came back. We come and see that coffee. We try to talk to policemen together with our pastor. We have gone and rent flame boot. That took that coffee, put him inside. But before we go, um, the agent of Boko Haram's, they have taken a megaphone moving around that village speak that every Christian he must be come return to the Muslim. Or when they are still coming for eight days to come in, they will not still using gun because gun is too loud when they hear that they, they can be run away. They will not use that gun, they will just use knife to cut every Christian. Roko Haram come attacked me in my house we are three in my house at that time. In that day, God, we are saving us, we are two. But one, one of my friends, Boko Haram, killed him. Now six Boko Haram called me us on that day. We are sleeping in the room, sleeping, Boko Haram talking. We come knock the door. 17 minutes past one o'clock in the night. We wake up, we are looking, I say, who is that? He say, hey, it's me. One of my friends won't open the door. I told him, say, leave it, leave it, leave it. And still, he want to open the door. We are three in the room. This one of my friends, he want to op he open the door. He come outside. Before, in the, the time he opened the, the tire jumping outside, he shoot one of my friends. He shoot one here, one here. So, me, I want to follow back of my, this is my friend. He put hand of my chest. Me, I come, I back inside of the room. I bend down for ground, I raise up my hand like this. I say, what happened? He said, me bring money. This your friend won't go, he won't run. We kill us. So bring money. I say, we have no money. The money with me, I don't have money. I say, we don't buy fish. Life cannot be the same again for these IDPs, but they are hopeful. Here, creativity is born out of hardship. With the crowd and congestion, many are prone to illnesses aside from those who came already ill. And when the burden press and seem beyond endurance, there is a place of solace to run to for worship and giving thanks. As I moved around this camp, one thing is evident. Life has dealt them a heavy blow, but their joyful spirit, cheerfulness, and happiness not crushed. 
explain away as if oblivious of their circumstance. The challenges are, however, enormous and more humanitarian assistance needed. I want to appeal. You can give scholarship to some of these children. You can contribute so that as much as you have, whether little or much, and you can just come here, look at all our needs, whatever aspect of our need that you know you can fit in, you are welcome. Now and again during our stay, they continued to entertain us to some local songs. Expressing gratitude for our coming. Firmly sharing in the collective hope that someday, just someday, they will be back to their homes united again with what is left, if any, of their loved ones. The big question remains when and how soon will this be?